Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. Uh, made it into March. Hope folks are doing well. We've got some good updates and a good gaggle of demos today to share. Um, so let's hop in. Metasploit framework. Let's let's catch up on Metasploit framework. Alan Foster is going to walk us through the latest and greatest. Alan, thanks, Chris. Uh, awesome. Uh, lots of new modules, lots of enhancements and features and bug fixes for the past two releases. Um, so for new modules, um, community member Romela Sebastian has contributed a new module for a directory traversal vulnerability in the SSL. Uh, VPN web portal of Fortius, uh, which is um, pretty much using a arbitrary read for, well, not even an arbitrary read, a read of the web session file containing plain text uh, credentials. And these credentials can be um, accessed via the creds database command um, after you've run the exploit successfully. And community member Beacles has contributed two new modules for Apache Flink. Uh, the first is an auxiliary module for the job manager, uh, which provides unauthenticated arbitrary file reads. And the second is an exploit, which gains arbitrary Java code execution. And I believe we'll have an Apache Flink demo later. Uh, community member Matthew Dunn has contributed a new module, uh, a new auxiliary scanner HTTP P RDP web login module, which leverages a timing behavior of the web RDP authentication process to determine valid users. We'll have a demo of this. And our very own Christoph de la Fuente has added a new evasion Windows module um, for the process herpaderping, uh, which applies the process herpaderping evasion technique um, for Windows payloads. And we'll have a demo of this. Uh, for enhancements and features, our very own Spencer McIntyre has updated the Quorum interpreter and console libraries to better handle cases where a given interpreter um, may not actually support a particular command. Uh, so now, instead, each version of the interpreter will authenticate that properly. Um, so instead of leading the cryptic errors, it'll sort of tell you up front. I believe we'll have a demo of this later. And our very own Alan Foster, i.e. myself, uh, has made improvements to Metasploit's console to have word wrapping enabled by default for all tables. I'll give a quick demo of that. And I've also updated the contribution workflow to require all new modules to pass Robocop and MSF tidy checks uh, prior to being merged to framework. Um, so a lot of these uh, generated alerts can actually be fixed automatically and we'll catch like security edge cases and other things. And I'll have a quick overview of that later. Uh, our very own Spencer McIntyre has improved the CV 2021-3156 um, module for IEV Barron's SAM edit, SAM edit module uh, with a couple of additional features that were left out due to the uh, time constraints from the uh, first submission. Um, so this includes cleanup and randomization of the payload library. And community member Beacles has improved the Soft SAMI FTP server uh, module, um, which was a user overflow module. Um, and he's improved that with documentation, as well as integrating the new auto check mix in, uh, which will automatically pre check if a target is vulnerable before running the exploit, uh, as well as making uh, reliability improvements. Uh, community member. Zero sum zero x zero has improved the PS exact MS 1710 module uh, to actually support additional fingerprinting for the Windows Storage Server 2008 R2 targets. Um, awesome. And for bug fixes, our very own Christoph de la Fiante has added a uh, bug fix for the auxiliary auth brute mixin uh, that caused a crash when the DB all users or DB all pass options were set. And this is not being addressed. So thanks for that. Uh, community member B calls has fixed a bug in the SCADA BR credential dumping module that prevented it from processing response data. Uh, our very own Spencer McIntyre has fixed a bug um, where sessions were incorrectly being validated due to the fact that the TLV encryption for the session would take place before session verification. Uh, the fix now considers interpreter sessions valid if they successfully negotiate TLV encryption. And this 
Fix also removes the auto verify session data store option, since all valid interpreter instances should negotiate TLV encryption automatically. And we'll have a demo of this later. And our very own Dean Welch has put a bug fix in for the Kiwi extension for interpreter. We'll have a quick demo of this later as well. And Dean has also improved the Metasploit framework modules that depend on the Faker library, uh, which is used for automatically generating fake uh, content for bypassing WAF, etc. Um, so that is now always going to be available, as opposed to some edge cases where it wasn't available and actually caused the module to fail. And the search command within Interpreter has been updated to support searches that start at the root directory, aka forward slash, and these types of searches were not previously available. Um, and we'll have a demo of that later. Um, awesome. As always, you can stay up to date with the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog posts on blog.rapid7.com. And a big thank you to the community and everyone involved in making Metasploit better. So thank you. So jumping into demos, uh, first off, we have Grant uh, talking about the session verification improvements. Uh, to the interpreter. Yeah, so this was an interesting change that was submitted by our own space and racket type. Um, if you just want to play the video so long here, it's a little bit easier to explain with the video than by words per se. Um, essentially what we're doing is we've created a little handler here. Uh, now previously what would happen is if you tried to connect to um, interpreter handler and let's just say in this case we connect with uh, netcat as you'll see shortly um, it's not supposed to be a valid connection um, previously it would metasploit itself would think that it, it was a valid connection and would just kind of hang there for a while until it timed out now the timeout was normally about five minutes so there was quite a bit of uh, delay between when you actually connected and when Metasploit thought, hey, you know, this session's uh, not correct. Um, so now what we do instead is we make sure that the TLV um, negotiation takes place. Now this is part of the um, new encryption that we added to Metasploit 6. And if that TLV negotiation does not complete successfully, uh, within 30 seconds, Metasploit will now say what it shows here, that the session is not valid and will be closed. Um, so this is just an interesting little update that we have um, because of the changes that we made with Metasploit 6 to make all of our um, sessions encrypted. Uh, we now check to make sure that they have negotiated that encryption correctly before deeming them valid. That's great. Um, and I grant believe you've got a demo showing the QE command arguments fix for interpreter extension. Yeah, so this one was a bug fix that we had with um, a kind of bad bug in Kiwi. Um, essentially, what would happen if you just play the video here um, is when running the Kiwi command, uh, essentially what happens with Kiwi command is we pass whatever argument is taken in to the command line for Kiwi. Um, unfortunately, we did not correctly read the wiki, which stated that the command line arguments have to be wrapped in double quotes um, for them to work properly. So this would lead to a very confusing error where it would the command would still work, but it would take any spaces and treat them as separate commands to like it would, it would just pass the arguments incorrectly um it wouldn't treat it as one argument it would treat it as like two separate arguments um so we now make sure that they are double code wrapped uh, so i just made a little typo here but if we type that in now you'll see if we scroll up here um Just let it go up. You can see there's no errors here. So I'm just going to scroll up to the very top of it. You can see now this no longer shows any errors, uh, whereas previously it would come up with um, no errors at the top. And then there would be an error at the bottom to say, hey, you know, we can't.
can't execute this command because we're not actually sure what you mean. Um, so hopefully this helps people who are trying to run Kiwi command actually execute their commands correctly and get the output that they're after. That's good. Thanks. I, I know a few people actually ran into that. Uh, the thread request and the fix for that was actually uh, uh, quite involved in the community with some workarounds provided as well. So good job fixing that, Dean, and presenting that, Grant. Awesome. Uh, another demo from yourself, Grant, uh, which will has made improvements to the interpreter search functionality. Yeah, so this one was actually from uh, our own Shelby Pace. Um, she noticed this while she was doing some testing. And I'm just, if you just play the demo here. Uh, basically, what happened is we had a bit of a logic bug within the search command um, itself, whereby it would try and incorrectly do some stripping of the command. Um, this led to an error whereby if you try to search from the root directory itself, it would not work as expected. So here I'm just going to show if we now try searching for all lib files from the root directory. And if you wanted to skip ahead uh, in the video a little bit, it does take a bit of time. Um, you can just skip forwards. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit of time to run because it's searching from the root directory. But uh, what you should see is that we now get all of the output. Previously, this command would not show any output at all. Um, because we were searching from the root directory and there was a bug that would incorrectly strip some of the command. Um, now we actually get all of the results. So uh, a little oversight on our part, but it's been fixed and now that works correctly. Nice. And I believe this one is a, a demo for a module that recently landed. So it's available in the repo right now. Uh, it, it missed the cut for the, our release last week, but it'll be in, in this week's release if I, if I have that right, Grant. Yeah, so this one was uh, one that's been getting some, a bit of news attention. So we wanted to just demo it this week, even though it's not, as you mentioned, been landed into the release cut yet, it will be in the next release cut. Um, so this one, if you just want to play the video, this was a um, unauthenticated deserialization vulnerability within HPE SIM. Um, the vulnerability occurs due to some missing checks um, that occur when deserializing an AMF message. Um, that is sent to a page that's available unauthenticated. Um, this leads to remote code execution as the user run HPE SIM. Typically, this is the administrator, as you'll see shortly. Um, and then from there, you can easily escalate privileges to system from the administrator on a Windows machine. Um, again, depends on what user you're running as, but uh, considering the privileges that HPE SIM requires, most likely it's going to be some form of administrator. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and set up the options here. Now this, this uh, module does support both uh, command line options and Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell does allow for uh, running a, sorry, obtaining a interpreter session. So we're just going to go ahead and use that. Also run the check command, uh, which supports checking if the target is vulnerable. Um, that just runs a simple command, like a, it just runs the command A just to see if the uh, deserialization worked or not. Um, so as you can see, the exploit is very quick to run, takes a couple of seconds. Um, and we got administrator and then we can escalate to privileges from, sorry, escalate privileges to system from there. Um, and if we just want to verify this, we can load QE and just do a quick credits MSV and you can see we're running a system and can dump the credentials. So very easy way to go from 
no access to a server to full access over it if you have if the server's on an administrator. That's great. That's a really good demo. Thanks, Grant. Yep, that was. Um, next off, we have a demo for the process herpaderping uh, evasion module. Uh, first off. <laughs> So uh, this is an evasion module based on the process herpetoping technique discovered by uh, Johnny Show. Um, so this module generates a Windows executable, which is basically a wrapper around a payload. So process herpetoping uh, consists in hiding the behavior of a process by modifying the content on disk after the image has been mapped in memory and before the first thread is created. So here is the process roughly. Um, we, uh, the, the module first, sorry, the main executable first drops the payload on disk uh, as another an executable. It then it maps it, this uh, um, uh, executable in memory and create the main process. Then it overrides the payload content on disk with another inoffensive binary. So by default, it's going to use the Windows calculator. And then finally, it starts the first thread to run the payload. So this works because security products usually inspect the file that was used to map the executable. Uh, this is done by re registering a callback in the Windows kernel. Uh, then it decides it's, uh, if the process is allowed to execute based on what is on disk. And here the process will execute something different than what is actually on disk. So uh, would you mind uh, starting the video, please? Thank you. Um, so here for this, I've set up a Windows uh, target, which is a uh, Windows 10 version 1909, uh, completely up to date uh, with Windows Defender enabled real time protection and a tamper protection, and also with ver various definition uh, up to date. So I've also installed on this machine uh, a, a web application, which is the well known. Uh, Damn vulnerable web application, DVA WA. Uh, WA. Um, uh, it's just to get some kind of uh, uh, almost real environment to test this. So what we're going to do to demonstrate this, uh, how this works, uh, we're going to use a normal payload, which is in this case, uh, uh, reverse TCP metabrator payload. We're going to generate the binary and use the, the application, the web application to upload this binary. Um, we also start a handler here to get our shell if it works, but. All right, so using the uh, DVWA application, we're gonna upload the payload here and see what's going to happen. Right, so it fails, as you can see. And uh, yeah, it, it did not even touch the disk. So um, as you can see on the on the Windows host, uh, uh, Windows Defender actually detect the payload and blocked uh, uh, blocked before any execution. Here we go. This is a, a PHP 10 file because it is how PHP works, <clears throat> but it contains our payload. Right, so now we're going to use the processor protein evasion module, which is just a wrapper around a, a payload. So we're going to set the options. Here are the default options. So the file name, which is randomly generated, the file that's uh, going to replace the payload on disk, uh, and the writable directory. So we run it. We're going to have an executable here, and we're going to 
uploaded the same way we did with the payload. So as you can see, the payload set here is the same payload than uh, before, so the reverse TCP metaprator payload. Okay, so let's upload this. And it worked. So apparently <clears throat> Windows Defender didn't get. All right, so let's make sure it is on the remote host. So we're gonna copy this and, and try to access um, the binary, the executable directly in the, uh, yeah, so, okay, we can access it. So it's there, gonna copy this path. It's, uh, it's gonna be useful to uh, execute it right after. So we're gonna use another section of this application, which is the common injection part. Uh, first, we're gonna check what is our current directory to make sure we're gonna call the uh, execute the, the binary using an absolute path. So here we go. So uh, if, if you want details on this application, um, you have a lot of details online. It's a very common application to learn how um, Web, web web attack web based attack uh, um, are, are working. It's 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 very interesting. If you if you don't know it, try try this. Um, but well, go back to whole payload. So we're gonna set up our path, changing the slash to backslash because it's Windows, and execute our payload. Right. So. Okay, we have a session. So we completely bypassed the antivirus. We managed to upload it and execute without Windows Defender detecting it. As you can see, we're on the right machine and on the same path we saw just before. So it has been tested on, on, on many Windows uh, version with Windows Defender uh, and also a vast antivirus. Uh, so it works pretty well and it's, uh, I'm sure it's gonna be very useful. That's brilliant. Um, next up, we have a Microsoft RDP web client login enumeration module demo by Brendan. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of the neat things, uh, so I would actually argue this is more a little more than a scanner. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't call it a, an exploit per se. Uh, previously, there was an Outlook web uh, vulnerability, I guess I would call it, in that you could try to log into the OWA system and based on the time that you were uh, refused entry, you could tell whether or not the username you used was correct. Uh, this same issue exists in the RDP web access server. Uh, and so Matt Dunn uh, wrote up a module for this. He also uh, wrote a uh, blog post on the Raxis blog page, which goes into a lot more detail than I will in this. But I wanted to go ahead and demo this and show you some of the gotchas that are involved with this really quickly. So if you want to go ahead and hit uh, play. So in this case, uh, one of the things I discovered is you cannot have the domain controller and the RDP web server on the same uh, host. So uh, if you do that, the timing isn't quite right. So in this case, uh, I'm unsetting domain. Uh, I'm just gonna try to use uh, a list of, uh, a, a username list. In this case, I'm using a Unix list. Uh, I did that just because I know there are a couple of usernames that are in that list that should come back as positive. And in this case, I'm pointing it at the, uh, the web RDP server.
and we fire this off and all of a sudden you can see all of these are coming back as valid usernames. I went ahead and stopped it. But if we go back and we look, um, you can see the timeouts are, there, there's, a, there's a huge gap in timeouts. 763 milliseconds for some, but 41 for others. So I'm now backing down, setting the timeout for 500, and now you can see it's starting to register what usernames are valid. So there is a little bit of uh, manipulation that you need to do on, on your part to use this. But once you do, it's really nice. Uh, this is was reported to Microsoft and Microsoft said that this was not something that they were going to do anything about. Uh, again, you can see uh, I added MSF user but once everything is set up correctly, you can see there's a, a very large gap between valid usernames and invalid usernames. There are no passwords right now. Uh, you can see actually the password wrong is the default password to try. Um, this will also work if you have usernames and passwords and will tell you if the username and password is correct. Uh, while this is finishing up, are there any questions? Uh, this seem, does seem like a good one to demo with the, the, a little bit of finesse involved there. Yeah, uh, the, the default timeout will work sometimes. It won't work other times, but there, if, if you run it and then check the uh, return data, you can. it's really easy to see the gap. Right on. Cool. Great. Um, this is also very reminiscent of the previous Metasploit CTF challenge written by Grant, which was a similar sort of timing attack where you had to enumerate users. And then from that, uh, based on the delay time coming back from the server, you could find out successful users. So it's cool saying CTF sort of vulnerabilities being sort of caught in the wild. It's great. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, next up, we have an Apache Flink RC module uh, by Spencer McIntyre. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So this vulnerability was contributed uh, by our own B. Coles, a longstanding community member who uh, submitted two modules uh, targeting Apache Flink. But today we are going to demo uh, what I think is the more interesting of the two, and that is the one that provides unauthenticated RCE. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. It's actually kind of a great segue because we were just talking about the CTF and we can see there at the top is the banner of the CTF winners. Those, uh, the, the bottom three rows of those are historical and going to be in our demos for all time. But here we are with uh, the Apache Flink. Uh, so this is going to leverage the REST API on uh, the remote web interface. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and run the check method. And so it's going to utilize one of those methods to pull down the version number to identify whether or not the target appears to be vulnerable. Uh, once we've identified that it's vulnerable, we're going to go ahead and upload and deploy our malicious jar file, uh, which in this case is our interpreter. And uh, after it is uploaded, we're able to go ahead and easily execute it. And we get a interpreter session running in the context of the user that started Apache Flink. Uh, so in this case, it's not uh, root. It was uh, my own user account. But still, uh, with our remote code execution, uh, might be a good opportunity to use a, another exploit, such as the uh, recent pseudo one that came out. And uh, that's it. That's great. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you. Uh, next up is myself uh, talking about the wrap table functionality in Metasploit console. Um, so uh, wrap tables were actually previously implemented in Metasploit's console um, due to a recent uh, 
implemented functionality of adding feature flags to Metasploit console to allow us to roll out sort of um, not yet ready for everyone features, but things that we want to test. Um, so now, uh, as of this release, um, all tables will now wrap by default, other than the search table and the creds table, as we believe that might impact pen testers' workflows of copying raw credentials or uh, plain text uh, plain text credentials or the module names. Uh, there's no impact to Metasploit Pro's console support, and you can still opt out with this functionality. So if it does break your workflow in any way, uh, raise an issue, and we can see your use case and make improvements when we're required. Um, so for some quick examples of before and afters. Awesome. So we can see the before and after screenshot of before. Uh, whenever a column's values were too long, they just spilled onto the next line. It was kind of unreadable. And then after, it's now actually uh, distinctly readable into its separate columns. Um, and on the next slide, we can see if you are a Termux user, this will probably impact you the most because you've sort of got the smallest screen retail space. Um, so that's sort of like an extreme sample. And then on the next slide, um, this is one that Dean actually ran into whenever he was using it. Uh, before it is, there is a table in there somewhere, it's just kind of hard to see. Uh, and then now on the next slide with it enabled, you can actually see the data is sort of segregated into its uh, columns and it's a lot more readable. Um, this feature request was open for about six years or so. So it's good to finally see that sort of released and usable. Was this, the, was this the one that Todd Beardsley was requesting years ago and said, please make this pleasant at, at 80 characters? Yep, that is exactly awesome. the one. <laughs> nice. And next up is myself again, talking about MSF Tidy and Robocop. Um, so yes, at a high level, the sort of goal of the MSF Tidy slash Robocop project was to increase module quality. Uh, and also allow the community to self-service a larger part of the pull request process themselves. Uh, we achieved that by enhancing MSF Tidy with uh, the power of Robocop, uh, which has a whole bunch of additional rules, um, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And importantly, it has automated code fixes as well. So instead of um, what previously used to happen was a uh, one of Rabbit7 or maybe a community member would review another uh, contribution and we'd notice Ruby problems, spend um, a lot of time reviewing it uh, for sort of like very easy to detect problems. And there'd be a sort of ongoing back and forth of, oh, can you fix this? Oh, you forgot this. Can you fix this one as well? Um, so now this is completely self-service. Um, self now you can just run all of the tooling yourself locally and it will fix pretty much all of the problems. And this is all enforced with a GitHub action now as well. And on the next slide, we'll see sort of what Robocop provides. So at a high level, it provides style slash layout consistency cops. So that's like just making sure that it's uh, sort of consistent with the rest of our code base, uh, or at least new models. Um, it also has security checks to ensure that you're not doing like raw opening of files or you're uh, vulnerable to um, you know, path traversal attacks or something remotely, um, as we've seen in the past. Um, it will also spot bugs and potential edge cases. Uh, some examples we saw were sort of subtle semantic differences between Python and Ruby, where if you look at the code as a Python developer, it seems totally legit, but actually Ruby will have um, slight semantic differences. So whenever we ran this over the past years of modules, we actually found bugs in like cleanup mechanisms and all sorts of just weird things that uh, Robocop was actually able to fix. And importantly, it also has automated fixes as well. So you can just fix nearly all of the problems in um, an efficient way. And for the next slide, so if you're making a pull request contribution, it'll appear as a, a new tick. Uh, I recently migrated Metasploit Framework to use GitHub Actions. They're very um, powerful and fast, so you can actually just scroll down the bottom of your pull request and click on Details uh, in the failure scenario, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, it will just call out like, hey, you've not formatted this correctly, or there's a security concern here, or whatever. And then we can see in the blue text saying like, info no CVE reference found. So you can ensure that um, you have updated your module with the correct CVE details. Um, and on the next slide, 
if you're already using Robocop, uh, sorry, if you're already using MSF Tidy, um, you can fix send it pretty much everything with the minus A flag. Um, uh, you'll be good to go. Thank you, Alan. There's some fantastic uh, usability improvements there, and uh, and uh, you know, thank you for walking us through those. And and big big thanks to everybody else who demoed uh, today. Uh, a lot of really good content there. So thank you, team. Appreciate that. Um, we've got a few more uh, updates here to round out our meeting today of other projects that the Metasploit teams work on, uh, including Attacker KB, the Attacker Knowledge Base. Um, you can you know learn about which phones matter and why, and leave your opinion on if they matter and why. Uh, just visit attackerkb.com. The team has some nice fixes and enhancements currently in progress, so nothing specific to demo this week, but I wanted to take the opportunity just to remind folks of our Attacker KB Slack space, where you can share feedback with the development team on your AKB experience, ask questions, uh, and connect with other AKB users. We also have a couple of uh, feed channels. They have the they end in the word feed there. Uh, you can see on the left if you like to get uh, Slack notifications, um, you can subscribe to those for a certain uh, act activity going on with the Tacker KB. Excellent. <laughs>